Okay. Dr. Grebowitz? Yes, my name is Meredith Grebowitz, and I'm a pediatrician. I've been in practice for 24 years. Um, I graduated from the Medical College of Georgia, and I trained at Tulane University uh, Medical School residency, and actually it was a combined tulane Oshner program um, at the time before Hurricane Katrina. So um, I'm here today to discuss my experience in 2019, between, uh, between 2019 and 2021, while I was employed at Oshner Clinic Foundation, where I spent 21 of those 24 years in practice and actually three more years um, in training. At the beginning of the COVID outbreak, I, like others, was trying to gather information in order to be prepared to care for patients and to protect my family. And one of my first activities was sewing masks with a friend of mine. I had ordered um, scientific grade um, filters to be inserted. This is when we were told that, you know, there might not be enough in 95 masks and everyone would need one. Um, so I'd already done the research to know that uh, the size of the coronavirus uh, molecule and to know that you had to have a, you know, a, a filter this strong to be able to protect yourself. Um, I spent hours online connecting with physicians around the country through social media and doing my own research um, regarding the pandemic response. And I think this is when my kind of thinking changed and I was no longer um, so much worried about this as when I started to notice things that didn't really make sense to me. So the uh, recommendation of wearing loose fitting disposable masks to protect us from a virus that I already knew was, you know, not gonna, gonna go right through that mask. Um, especially wearing those masks outside, that made no sense. Performing PCR tests on asymptomatic um, people, that makes no sense and actually, I think, instilled a lot of fear in people um, and caused people to wanna stay away from one another. Closing churches, gyms, small businesses while keeping big, big box stores open. And then the recommendation of the six feet with no um, scientific reason for that recommendation. Overall though, what struck me was just the spirit of fear that was created and fostered by both media and medical leaders. What we know as medical providers is that in an emergency situation, it's most important to stay calm, um, definitely not to create panic or fear. And it was in this setting that COVID-19 mRNA vaccines became available under emergency use in December, 2021, which began a national vaccine program. CDC data in February 20 of 21, I'm sorry, February 2021, um, that data showed that Americans, regardless of their age group, were far more likely to die from something other than COVID, even amongst those that were most heavily impacted, those that were 85 years or older. So only 13.3% of all deaths between February 2020 and February 2021 were due to COVID, and that's the CDC's data. In March of 2021, physicians within the medical system where I was working, we began to receive emails urging us to encourage vaccination within our communities. In response to one email, I responded with what I thought was a common sense response and um, very well thought out. Um, I was advocating for natural immunity, especially in healthy young adults and children in order to protect the elderly. Um, what we knew is that Natural immunity produces both an IgG, so you have antibodies, and the two antibodies that were came into play here were IgG, which is in your bloodstream, and IgA, which is secreted by your mouth, your nose, your lungs, and your GI tract. So what we knew about natural immunity was that you produced both IgG and IgA to both the spike protein and the body of the virus. So you had an antibody in your bloodstream, you had mucosal protection, and it wasn't just to the spike protein, it was also to the body of the virus. We knew at that time that all of the COVID mutations were occurring in the spike protein. The immune response to COVID vaccines only produced IgG to the spike alone. So another way to look at that, a shot in the arm only provoked um, provides an IgG antibody response in the bloodstream, but natural immunity <clears throat> provides the mucosal response. So it was obvious to me at that time that the COVID shot was not going to prevent infection or transmission because the way you catch COVID is through your nose, your mouth, your respiratory tract, and you had no IgA protection from the vaccine. 
when I responded to this email, another physician, speaking of hubris, um, within the pediatric department responded and copied a few of the lead administrators at the organization. He said, I hope you do not tell this information to your patients. At this institution, we are trying to promote vaccinating as many people as possible. Shortly after this, I was invited to meet with an upper level administrator at uh, the Mothership or main campus um, in New Orleans to discuss my concerns. That was the way I was invited. During this meeting, I was told that the organization had already decided to move forward with COVID vaccines. And this was, you know, the pediatric department. So they were, this is heading towards teenagers and children. And I was advised not to respond on department emails expressing my concerns or, you know, the, anything negative that I might have to say about COVID shots. In May of 2021, um, Dr. Bartlett mentioned this yesterday, a study was, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, this is something different. In May of 2021, there was actually, um, there were slides, and this has been published too, but there was an observational study that where they looked at the ICUs at both Oshner and UMCNO, so charity, and in the ICUs, 93.5% of the COVID patients had low vitamin D levels. And I never heard anything else about vitamin D again. <laughs> Um, also, in May of 2021, a paper was published, this is what Dr. Bartlett had mentioned, um, showing that the spike protein causes the pathology that we see, or most of the pathology, that we see with COVID infections. Also in May, and so I'm like following all of these studies, reading about these, and just like, you know, um, very disturbing, I would say, knowing that the vaccines are being given and they're heading towards kids. Also in May, a Harvard, a Harvard study was published finding that spike protein circulates in the bloodstream, and they had looked only for 30 days, but they were able to find, and a percentage of those patients, I think it was like 13%, um, that the COVID vaccines, after the COVID vaccine, the spike protein circulated in the bloodstream. Okay, so there's not even supposed to be spike protein in the bloodstream, right? You know, it's supposed to stay in the arm, and um, so that was concerning. In June of 2021, I became aware of the biodistribution study that um, Dr. Bartlett had mentioned yesterday, and I think I had copies of that study for you guys. You know, the um, all of the different diseases that Pfizer found were caused. Y'all have that? Okay, good. Um, so that was um, Dr. Um, Mr. Seary had requested that through a FOIA request, and that study showed that the lipid nanoparticles and mRNA distribute throughout the body, everywhere, after the shot is given in the muscle. And at that time, the public and physicians were being told that the nanoparticles and the mRNA would stay, you know, in the muscle where the shot was given. given. Through research, I also learned that lipid nanoparticles alone induce severe inflammation and massively aggravate pre-existing inflammation. I knew that COVID mRNA vaccine technology had never been used in an effort to prevent a respiratory virus and that the technology is nothing like any of our other vaccines that we give. We give vaccines as pediatricians every day, you know, educate parents. Um, it's nothing like that, it is gene therapy. And uh, on May 10th, 2021, COVID vaccines were granted emergency use, not FDA approval, but emergency use authorization in 12 to 15 year olds. And pediatricians throughout the system received emails with suggested talking points to be used during discussions with, pa with parents regarding the COVID-19 vaccine for teens. The talking points claimed that the COVID shots uh, vaccines showed 100% efficacy there were so many red flags, but like nothing is 100%, you know, effective. Um, we were told that vaccinating children and teens for COVID-19 should be treated just like any other routine vaccination, measles, mumps, chicken pox. Uh, COVID vaccines at this point were only emergency use authorized. The talking points also claim that there was no evidence that the COVID vaccine would affect child development, puberty, or fertility. And later, we, we find that list of all of the um, problems that can develop. Plus, I knew from the biodistribution study that um, in the first 24 hours, the ovaries uptook the majority, the most, of the um, lipid nanoparticles, second only to the blood bone marrow. So the, all of the different leukemias and blood 
problems, you know, blood diseases that have developed after, no surprise to me. And the talking points also, it was recommended that we utilize something called presumptive language, presumptive language. This is using language that presumes that the patient will accept the vaccine. We were encouraged to communicate to our patients and parents that getting vaccinated was the norm and that we strongly recommended them to do it. And we were encouraged to make sure that the child had an appointment scheduled to receive their COVID-19 vaccine before they left our office in bold. <laughs> um, three things about this. Number one is I was very insulted after practicing for 24 years that um, someone was going to try and coach me on medical decision making. Also, um, you know, these were only emergency use authorized. They were not FDA approved. And then I was very concerned about patients not receiving informed consent. So again, the three components Dr. Bartlett spoke about yesterday is that the patients have the right to know every treatment option, risk and benefits of every treatment option, and any financial conflict of interest that might be present. In early June of 2021, a 15-year-old patient of mine began experiencing myoclonic seizures at school. Her first seizure began five hours after her first dose of the, of the Pfizer COVID vaccine. On her way to the ER, her jerking movements became so violent that her mother had to pull the car over and, and call an ambulance. She was concerned that the child would be injured or, um, you know, she was worried about her moving around in the car. In the ER, she was told by the attending physician that these seizures were absolutely not related to the COVID vaccine that she had received. She was told to follow up with a neurologist and she came to, came to see me the next day. The mother was extremely concerned and suspected that the seizures were related to the vaccine. And when I called the pediatric neurologist in our department, very similar to the um, injured patient who spoke earlier, the neurologist said that she would definitely recommend giving a second vaccine, that even if this was a seizure um, with the vaccine, that COVID would be much worse. So not only was the adverse event ignored, not reported to VAERS, um, they were told to get a second vaccine. They would have been told if she'd gone to see the neurologist. <clears throat> the mother reported the adverse event herself to VAERS and the lot number on her own. The child did not receive a second shot that child did have to um, finish the school year at home because she continued to have the seizures while she was at school. So uh, for the next month while I was practicing at Oshner, I recommended vitamin D supplementation, regular exercise, very common sense approach to staying you know, well and um, supporting your immune system. And I encouraged patients to allow me to order blood work for them um, because so many of the parents felt like the kids, you know, they get out in the sun, they drink milk, that their vitamin D was fine, and so many of them were low. Um, also, I would do blood work for COVID antibodies because I found that so many of the kids, they didn't even realize they'd already had COVID and uh, they would have COVID antibodies. So I recommended against COVID shots in healthy children, and I emphatically recommended against COVID shots in the group that already had natural immunity. On July 29th, 2021, during a regular clinic day, late in the afternoon, I was approached by a physician administrator. I was asked to stop seeing patients and to step with him in, into an exam room. And at that point in time, he told me that I had three choices. I could get a COVID shot, I could wear an N95 mask at all times in the clinic, or I could quit my job. And so it's important to note that at this time, this was months before Oshner had terminated people for not getting a COVID shot. So he really couldn't have made me get a COVID. I just was caught very off guard. So he couldn't have made me get a COVID shot. And um, no one else was wearing an N95 mask all the time in the clinic. So he couldn't have really made, I think he wanted me to quit and I don't quit. So when I didn't quit, <laughs> he had a termination letter behind his back. So he handed that to me and um, I was asked to turn over my laptop computer, my badge, collect my things and leave the building. And this was all done in front of all of my colleagues, all of the staff. Um, so in other words, I was made an example of, and so people knew, um, other physicians, well, everybody in the clinic knew at that point, you know, if you speak out and express a different opinion, this can happen. I'm currently in a growing solo pediatric practice, and for the first time in decades, I can say I'm enjoying the practice of medicine, unhindered, no political pressure. Um, I think it's important to know that there's legislation in place um, that's supposed to protect from this type of thing. It's called the corporate practice of medicine. 
And um, it specifically is supposed to protect physicians employed so that the hospital's not practicing medicine, because that's exactly what's happening. If a physician employed by a hospital is being dictated to, even, you know, they, they know. They know they can't prescribe ivermectin or they will lose their job. So if that's the case, they're not practicing medicine. The hospital is practicing medicine. It concerns me that there seems to be a form of learned helplessness in the medical community with physicians, a lack of curiosity, a lack of independent thinking, and sometimes even common sense. And personally, I went to school for much too long for um, a hospital, an administrator, a government agency to dictate in the practice of medicine. A physician should never be afraid to have a differing opinion, and science should always be questioned. And a physician should be able to voice his or her own opinion without fear of retribution or loss of employment. My contract at Oshner did contain, I didn't realize this because I joined them after residency and you're just so happy to finish training and actually have a salary and a job, um, you know, and doctors aren't attorneys. So sometimes we don't realize in contracts some of the things that we might want to negotiate. Um, but my contract had a termination without cause clause in it, and I'm not sure how, how common those are, but that allowed for my termination with no explanation of why I was terminated. Although I think I know why. Um, suggestions for the committee, I would definitely agree um, with Dr. Hansen that independent physicians, if you're going to have someone in an advisory role to the governor or to, to the legislature, um, to make sure that they're independent and they're free of any, any bias or any pressure from an employer. Um, to any young physician signing a contract, I would recommend that they have a termination without cause clause removed from their contract before they sign it. And um, any steps that you can take to enforce that um, corporate practice of medicine to back physicians up and to protect them from, you know, any retribution or loss of employment. Oh, also, um, there were a couple of anonymous complaints to the bo medical board that I had to address by hiring an attorney. And um, they were dismissed, but there that is one way um, that physicians can be... Um, um, Retribution can take place or harassment is kind of how it felt. Um, so those anonymous complaints, you might want to look at that. I know that happened a lot in Texas and other states. I don't know if you guys have heard much about that. Um, I had, okay. I would like to say in closing that I'm very proud to stand with brave physicians here and around the country fighting for truth and medical freedom, and we're fulfilling our oath to first do no harm. Thank you, Doctor. Uh